All right, so we're back in the book Queen Mu and the Egyptian Pinx by Augustus Le Plongeon. All right, 1896. The existence of the Western continent was no more a mystery to the inhabitants of the countries bordering on the Mediterranean than to those whose shores are bathed by the waves of the Indian Ocean. All right, they knew about us. Palmiki and his beautiful epic, the Ramayana. So check it out, Ra Maya nah. says that in times so remote that the sun had not yet risen above the horizon, the Mayas, great navigators, terrible warriors, we're talking about Jaguar warriors, learned architects, Toltecis, conquered the southern part of the Indo-Chinese Peninsula and established themselves there. All right, and I can prove this if you saw my corn videos part one all right there was corn in asia thousands of years ago corn and that's original to america now you're seeing the connection here right who's bringing it over there and helping them get civilized with this corn and that's why you see all these hindu statues watch part two of my corn video holding all this corn in their hands and all the stories they have in asia they call it imperial wheat, right? In those areas of the world, Europe and Asia, they were calling corn wheat, all right? In these historic accounts, but it was corn they were talking about, all right? Imperial wheat or imp Turkish wheat, all right? So dig into that. So the Mayas, again, they were going and basically conquering southern parts of the Indo-Chinese Peninsula and established themselves there. We're talking about the Drakan or Dragon Kings. The Dragon, this is the Plum Serpent. You understand what we're telling you? Overstand. All right? These are the Drakans, the Dragon Kings, the Dragon Dynasty, the Snake Dynasty, the Khans, the Amara Khans, the Plum Serpent, the Feather Serpent. All right? In the classic authors, Greek and Latin, we find frequent mention of the great Saturnian continent distant many thousand stadia from the pillars of Hercules toward the setting sun. Plutarch in his life of Solon says that when the famed Greek legislator visited Egypt 600 years before the Christian era, Sanchez, a priest of Saïs, also Senophis, a priest of Helopolis, told him that 9,000 years since the relations of the Egyptians with the inhabitants of the lands of the West had been interrupted because of the mud that had made the sea impassable after the destruction of Atlantis by the earthquakes. All right, so that's interesting, right? So we know that Plato tells the same, right? Plato, the story of Plato. He says that in ancient times, um, the Atlantic was navigable. Now remember, he's talking in his present time, Plato, because in his time, you can't pass the Atlantic Ocean. There's like a barrier there. And again, we get the same from the, uh, the same account, right? From these other Greeks. Again, they're saying that the, that it was because of what had happened to Atlantis, the destruction. Are we talking about the Great Flood, right? After the days of Peleg, the separation of the land, right? In the days of Peleg. Is that what we're talking about here? All right? There was some, there was like mud. There was so much destruction there, you know, it was impassable. There was like a barrier. They couldn't get to us. You understand what the Most High did? Alajawana Hawa. We were protected for a while, you know, while we were still following the laws. All right. There was a barrier here. They couldn't. It was impassable after the destruction of Atlantis by earthquakes. The same author again in his work, De Fasi and Orbi Luna has Scylla recount to his brother Lampias all he had learned concerning them from a stranger he met at Carthage, returning from the transatlantic countries. Foreign Quarterly Review. So I just want to remind everyone about the Foreign Quarterly Review, this uh, journal right here. So this has many volumes. Um, if you haven't watched my other videos, I mentioned that you know I found this on volume 18 as you can see here and this is in the Harvard University collection this is a very scholarly journal 
uh, in review. And again, we're talking about an expedition that was done to Palenque and certain sites in Mexico. All right. So I just want to continue reading from this book, which correlates with what we're basically uh, been learning, you know, recently. There are numerous rock hewn monuments scattered throughout Central America, which the natives call granaries of the giants. Granaries of the giants. I'm reminded of uh, the Old Testament, Joseph, right? Uh, and, and Egypt, the seven years of pro prosperity and the seven years of famine. How he, they stored the corn, right? The corn, which is American. Not talking about wheat, we're talking about corn. If you've seen my corn videos, you know what I'm talking about. So, again, it says that in Central America, there's large granaries of the giants, right? But which in every respect resemble the Cyclopean fabric near Argos in Greece, called the treasury of Atreus. So where is the real treasury of Atreus? The form of these structures is generally dome-shaped, a gallery leads to a central room, which is lighted by a cavity from the dome. In some cases, the doorway to this gallery resembles, in its cyclopean structure, the gate of Mycenae. But there are some singular exceptions, in which a knowledge of the arch and of the keystone, and the same thing has been proved by Rossellini and Belsoni to have existed anciently in Egypt, is clearly assignable to these architectural barbarians. Again, sepulchers have been found constructed on the very same model as those of Cyprus and Asia Minor, which probably preceded, but were at all events contemporary with the most ancient monuments of Egypt. All right, so look what they're telling us. That these monuments, he's saying they are in the same time as the monuments of Egypt. So if Egypt is older, they've been teaching us all our lives. Why are they saying it's old? If it's on the same time as this guy is saying it. But we know we are older over here. You know? Do you know how to do carbon-14 dating? Do you understand carbon-14 dating? It doesn't even go past 10,000 years. And, and, and how they use it is controversial. It's disputed by many scholars. New York Times article, look it up. You know, there's way more articles than that, but I'm just telling you, look it up. You know, we got to trust their chronology and their science because we were never, you know, given the opportunity to learn this. You know, this was stripped from what we knew, you know, anciently. Uh, you know, these, these tribes of America had this uh, ancient science and knowledge way before it was taken over there by Toth, as he says in the Emerald Tablets, right? He came from Atlantis and he went over there to where the sun rises. They are generally in the form of the Egyptian cross. Again, they're talking about the monuments they're finding here in America and Mexico. We're talking about contemporary with the most ancient monuments of Egypt again. And it says they are generally in the form of the Egyptian cross. So is it really an Egyptian cross or Aboriginal American cross? A sloping passage intended to be closed leads to a vestibule supported by a single column and ornamented with the mad work scroll, out of which branch sepulchral chambers to the right and left. In the Antiquities Mexicanis, rock-built fortifications are exhibited, which precisely resemble similar cyclopean structures at Tirings and Perugia. The walls of their cities and fortresses are built of rough stones, irregularly fitted into each other and arranged in irregular courses precisely as all the walls of known Cyclopean origin discovered in Greece and Italy are constructed. All right, so we're back in the book Queen Mu and the Egyptian Sphinx by Augustus Le Plongeon. All right, 1896. That the Western continent was visited by the Carthaginians a few years before the in indicting of Plato's 
Atlantis, the portraits of men with long beards and Phoenician features, discovered by me in 1875, sculptured on the columns and ante of the castle of Chichen, bear witness in Sangbao, Mexico, bear witness, he's saying, seeing people with long beards and Phoenician features, all right? Now remember, who was settling in these places, all right? We got in the foreign quarterly review that before the actual Toltecs, there was another, what they call Cyclopean, giant wonders, Masonic wonders that build these things, all right? So that we have giants, and we know the story of Jehoshua, Joshua, kicking out the Hamites, Moabites, Canaanites out of the promised land, right? And then settle in there. So these were giants, right? And that story too. We know the Inca, right? Say the same thing that before they got to Cusco and Tiwanaku, that the big boulders and all that was built already and it was by giants. We know the Olmec. If you read any accounts of the Olmec, it seems that the Olmec had some kind of war with some giants that were there, that area of Mexico. So they had to defeat the giants before settling down. All right. So that coincides really with the Bible, really with Joshua, right? All right. So again, he's finding this in Mexico, right? So it says here, Diodorus Siculus attributes the discovery of the Western continent to the Phoenicians and describes it as a country where the landscape is varied by very lofty mountains and the temperatures always soft and equable. Procopius alluding to it says it is several thousand stadia from Ogigia, Ogigia and encloses the whole sea into which a multitude of rivers descending from the highlands discharge their waters. All right, so they're describing America. Now, we've already gone over this, the whole mythology of Greek, the whole Greek mythology, right? They, they're always talking about the Americas, Atlantis, you know, the gods, right? And this is examples they're showing you here, all right? Theopompus of Kyo, speaking of its magnitude, says, compared with it, our world is but a small island. And Cicero mentioning it makes us, makes use of nearly the same words. Omnis enim terra, qualitur obibis parva, quadam es insula. Aristotle in his work, the Mirabil Acuscultatio, given an account of it, represents it as a very large and fertile country. A very large and fertile country. Just go back to part two, so you can see how fertile it was. Well watered by abundant streams, and he referred to a decree enacted by the Senate of Carthage toward the year 509 BC, intended to stem the current of immigration that had set toward the Western lands, as they feared it might prove detrimental to the prosperity of their city. The belief in the former existence of the extensive lands in the middle of the Atlantic and the submergence and the consequences of seismic convulsions existed among scientists even as far down as the 5th century of the Christian era. Proclus, one of the greatest scholars of antiquity, who during 35 years was at the head of the Neoplatonic school of Athens and was learned in all the sciences known in his day, in his commentaries on Plato's Timius says, the famous Atlantis exists no longer, but we can hardly doubt that it did once. For Marcellus, who wrote a history of Ethiopian affairs, says that such and so great an island once existed, and that it is evidenced by those who composed histories relative to the external sea. For they relate that in this time there were seven islands in the Atlantic Sea sacred to Prosperpin, and besides these three of immense magnitude, sacred to Pluto, Jupiter, and Neptune, and besides this, the inhabitants of the last island, Poseidonis, preserved the memory of their ancestors and of its governing for many periods, uh, all the islands in the Atlantic Sea. From this isle, one may pass to other large islands beyond, other islands beyond, which are not far from the firm land near, which is the true sea. The true sea. Are we talking about the Pacific? All right, so you see all these accounts I told you, their whole mythology is based on America. And who are the Greeks? Who are the Greeks?
foreign quarterly review. There is another and still more remarkable instance of the architectural identity which we are endeavor endeavoring to demonstrate. Some of their palaces, but more especially the combined temple, palace, and city of Palenque are characterized by the well-known Cycoplian arch consisting of receding steps of stone in a triangular form. At Palenque, a rectangular square is surrounded by cloisters built in this manner, being lighted by windows bearing the exact form of the Egyptian Tau. Again, in Palenque, you're going to find a rectangular square surrounded by cloisters. It says here, built in this manner, being lighted by windows bearing the exact form of the Egyptian Tau or the Ankh, right? Let's take a deep breath because this is a, it's a lot to take in, not because it's new to me, but it's just amazing how much has been left out of the textbooks in our history classes, right? In high school, in middle school, even elementary school, right? We have thrown a rapid glance over the architecture and over the sculptures which exist in New Spain in the various ruined monuments of the extraordinary and powerful nation whose empire along with every certain memorial of their name has long passed away you know you still here we shall proceed to draw upon the descriptions and illustrations in the works before us for an equally brief and we hope perspicuous and popular view first of their personal characteristics and costumes Second, of their religion and religious rites. Third, of their hieroglyphical language and of the state science among them. We purpose to conclude by inquiring into the origin of these extraordinary people, whence they came, who they were, how it was that they imbued the mythology of New Spain with the most striking analogies to the mythological system which is known to have existed in the most remote times in Egypt, India, and even Italy. We shall advert in the course of this inquiry to the theory especially taken up by Lord Kingsborough. Now he's going to talk about how, you know, Lord Kingsborough and his work, you know, we read earlier again, that Basically, Lord Kingsborough was an Irish antiquarian who sought to prove that the indigenous peoples of the Americas were a lost tribe of Israel, right? His principal contributions was in making available facsimiles of ancient documents and some of the earliest explorers' reports on pre-Columbian ruins and Maya civilization. Facsimiles, meaning exact copies. He was on to something. The personal characteristics, physiognomy, and custom of the extraordinary nation whose monuments we are discussing and whom for the sake of avoiding confusion and prolixity we shall call Tultecans, although we doubt the strict propriety of the designation, will be found among the illustrations of Castaneda, accompanying the original work of Dupax and which are copied by the artists employed in the Antiquities Mexicanes, published in Paris at the Bureau of Mexican Antiquities. Both, however, merely reproduce and thereby honorably prove the accuracy of the illustrations published long previously by Captain Del Rio in his description of the ruins of an ancient city. The sculptures in question are the most extraordinary and bring before us a people as extraordinary as if they appertain to another planet. All right, so they're trying to bring you to space. All right, so let's stay grounded. Their physiognomy is unlike any of the various families of the human race with which any other sculptures or monumental records have previously rendered us familiar. Their receding forehead their low facial angle and the conical form of their heads would, according to the ordinary principles of their craniologists, indicate little short of idiotism. Did we not perceive on the very monuments 
where the elementary data of craniology would seem to testify against them. Marks of a powerful, civilized, and enlightened people. The sculptures which reveal these novel characteristics in the outward form and lineaments of a distinct nation are bas reliefs which appear in the form of metal piece on the square pilasters, which alternating with similar square doorways form the outward facade of the Cyclopean cloisters, which surround one of the rectangular courts of the great temple of Palenque. The architectural forms with which these sculptures are associated are as unique as the sculptures themselves. Yet, is there a general resemblance to the metatopies of the Greek temples? Inasmuch as in the instance of the Pantheon itself, two analogous figures appear on each tablet, one of the victor, the other of the vanquished. Other physiognomical characteristics not less singular than the low angle of their facial elevation, mark the countenance of the extraordinary people, thus curiously preserved for our inspection. The nose is large, long, and prominent. Again, the nose is large, long, and prominent. So much so as to amount to a deformity when contrasted with the receding forehead. The facial line recedes in the same singular manner from the base of the nostrils to the termination of the chin. But as if these curious physiognomical signs were not sufficient to distinguish them from the any race of people with which we are acquainted, the receding angle of the lower portion of the face is grotesquely broken by an unsightly protrusion of the lower lip. These are the general characteristics of the nation. But there are some of the sculptures which depict individuals less revolting to the European standard of physiognomical beauty. These characteristics are still more important than they are singular, inasmuch as we think they will help, in the course of the ensuing investigation, to furnish tolerably clear views of the origin, or at least of the original location, of the people. We continue in the book Queen Mu and the Egyptian. Sphinx by Augustus Plongeon. It is well to notice that, like all the Maya authors who have described the awful cataclysms that caused the submergence of the land of Mu, Proclus mentions the existence of ten countries or islands as Plato did. Can this be a mere coincidence, or was it actual geographical knowledge on the part of these writers? Inquiries are often made as to the causes that led to the interruption of the communications between the inhabitants of the western continent and the dwellers on the coast of the Mediterranean after they had been renewed by the Carthaginians. It is evident that the mud spoken of by the Egyptian priests had settled in the course of centuries and that the sea weeds mentioned by Hamilco had ceased to be a barrier sufficient to impede the passage since Carthaginians reached the shores of Yucatan at least 500 years before the Christian era. All right, so just, just real quick, remember, they said the Atlantic was impassable. There was mud all over there, right? But like it's saying here, as time went on, the mud had settled, all right? The seaweeds were gone. There was no more barriers to impede the passage. It seems that the Carthaginians... We're going back and forth. Who are these Carthaginians? Were they really from America? And I believe so. The Phoenicians, Carthaginians, really just originated from here. All right? So, and they were going from the Yucatan back and forth. All right? These causes may be found in the destruction of Carthage, of its commerce and its ships by the Romans under Plu Plubius Scipio. The Romans never were navigators. After the fall of Carthage, public attention being directed to their conquest in Northern Africa, in Western Asia, and in Greece, to their wars with the Teutons and the Cimbri, to their own civil dissensions and to the many other political events that preceded the decadence and disintegration of the Roman Empire. The maritime expeditions of the Phoenicians and of the Carthaginians, their discoveries, 
of distant and transatlantic countries became well nigh forgotten. On the other hand, those hardy navigators kept their discoveries as secret as possible. Hmm. With the advent and ascendancy of the Christian church, the remembrance of the existence of such lands that still lingered among students as that of the Egyptian and Greek civilizations was utterly obliterated from the mind of the people. All right. So they knew there was these lands that still existed, but they wanted to erase that knowledge from the people for the, you know, they didn't want the people to know. If we are to believe Tertullian and other ecclesiastical writers, the Christians during the first centuries of the Christian era held in abhorrence all arts and sciences, which like literature, they attributed to the muses and therefore regarded as artifices of the devil. They consequently destroyed all vestiges as well as all means of culture. They closed the academies of Athens, the schools of Alexandria, burned the libraries of the Serapian and other temples of learning, which contained the works of the philosophers and the records of their, res re their researches in all branches of human knowledge. The power of stream, the power of steam and electricity not accepted. They depopulated the countries bathed by the waters of the Mediterranean plunged the populations of Western Europe into ignorance, superstition, fanatism, threw over them as an intellectual motory pal, the black wave of barbarism that during the Middle Ages came nigh, wiping out all traces of civilization, which was saved from total wreck by the followers of Mahomet, whose great mental and scientific attainments illumined that night of intellectual darkness, as a brilliant meteor, too soon extinguished by those minions of the church, the members of the Holy Inquisition established by Pope Lucius III, the inquisitors imitating their worthy predecessors, the metropolitans of Constantinople and the bishops of Alexandria, closed the academies and public schools of Cordoba, where Pope Sylvester II and several other high dignitaries of the church had been admitted as pupils and acquired under the tuition of Moorish philosophers. Moorish. Who? Popes? Are we talking about Vatican popes? What? Acquired under the tuition of Moorish philosophers? Knowledge of medicine, geography, rhetoric, chemistry, physics, mathematics, astronomy, and the other sciences contained in the thousands of precious volumes that formed the superb libraries which the inquisitors wantonly destroyed a legend St. Paul's example. Abundant proof of the intimate communications of the ancient Mayas with the civilized nations of Asia, Africa, and Europe are to be found among the remains of their ruined cities. Their peculiar architecture, embodying their cosmogonic and religious notions, is easily recognized in the ancient architectural monuments of India, Chaldea, Egypt, and Greece, in the Great Pyramid of Gizeh, in the famed Parthenon of Athens. Although architecture is an unerring standard of the degree of civilization reached by people and constitutes therefore an important factor in historical research, although it is as correct as test of race as is language and more easily applied and understood, not being subject to changes, I have refrained from availing myself of it in order not to increase the limits of the present work. Foreign quarterly review we follow the subject into the next division according to the line we have chalked out we mean the custom of the people represented on the metal piece in question as well as in the sanctuaries and on the walls of different temples it has been rather rashly in intimated in a learned periodical which glanced at the subject some few years ago that the custom in question is perfectly egyptian Again, they're talking about what they're finding in Mexico. Let's not get lost, right? This is not the case. There are some striking analogies with the Egyptian custom, but there are at the same time differences from it as striking. The Egyptian apron compared with the corresponding Tultecan covering was very different. It was generally a stripped cotton and folded in a peculiar manner, a portion of it forming a girdle and passing between the legs, resembling a similar article of dress worn by the East Indians at the present day. But the Tultecan apron 
resembles the Roman military apron. Again, but the Toltecan apron resembles the Roman military apron or the Scottish filibag. Thanks for, uh, and thanks to uh, King Drop for showing us, you know, uh, forbidden histories of America, I believe, yeah. You know, Toltecus, right, and Theodorus, right? I'm right, talking about Romani, Roman. <laughs> so, continue it says, It descends from the waist and covers the thigh down to the knee. It is, however, distinguished by one Egyptian apprentice, namely by the mimic tail of an animal, which appears as a mark of ancient origin, probably, to have adorned the Tultecan hero as it adorned the Egyptian demigod. All right, and you know what? We're talking about Wakanda for life here. We're talking about the Jaguar warriors, the suits they wore. They did have tails, you know, and a lot of their uh, uh, drawings and, and the murals and the walls, you can find this, all right? All right, so that's Wakanda they're talking about. So they're saying that this is a mark of ancient origin, probably. All right, so we can find it in, in the people wearing it in Americas, but in Egypt, you'll find it in mythology, in the demigods. Because, you know, again, the mythology of Egypt and Babylon, they're just retelling the stories of the ancient world of America. The antediluvian world, uh, Atlantis, you know, by Ignatius Donnelly, you know, he clearly lets us know that, you know, a lot, most of the gods of, of Greek, Romans, and all that came from Atlantis, right? And who was the Atlanteans? All right, so... Again, continuing says, nothing like a tunic supported by straps, sometimes covered by a cuirass and girdled at the waist, which was the dress of the military and superior class in Egypt, is to be found in the Toltecan custom. And you guys starting to understand. The apron is supported by a baldric, which descends from the right shoulder to the left side and joins the girdle at the waist. There are, however, some strong resemblances. Thus, the breastplate and collar of the Tultecans were sometimes decorated with a symbol of the sun. The armlets, the armlets, bracelets, and ankles strikingly resemble the Egyptian. But the legs of the Tultecan heroes are invested with sandals, some of them reaching above the ankles and strikingly resembling the Roman, some of them, like griefs, cover the leg as high as the lower part of the knee. And some of them, in every respect, seem to resemble the highland sandal, so minutely indeed, as even to imitate the same di di diagonal cross-line pattern. The patterns of the stuffs of which the aprons are made are often various and elegant, sometimes flowered, diamonded, or leopard spotted. All right, so they're saying leopard. We know if we're in America, I don't know why this guy is saying leopard, but if we are talking about the Americas, we are talking about jaguars. All right, not leopards, jaguars. Jaguar warriors, Wakanda. I reserve the teachings that may be gathered from the study of Maya monuments for a future occasion restricting my observations now principally to the memorial hall at Chichen, or Chiken, dedicated to the manes of Prince Ko by his sister, wife, Queen Mu, and to the ma mausoleum erected by her order to contain his effigy and his cremated remains. In the first, she caused to be painted on the walls of the funeral chamber, the principal events of his and her life just as the Egyptian kings had the events of their own lives painted on the walls of their tombs. Language is admitted to be a most accurate guide in tracing the family relation of various people, even when inhabiting countries separated by vast extents of land or water. In the present instance, Maya, still spoken by thousands of human beings and in which the inscription sculptured on the walls of the temples and palaces in the ruined cities of Yucatan are written, as are also the few books of the ancient Maya, sages that have come to our hands, will be the thread of Aretni that will guide us in the following 
tracks of the colonists from Mayak, Mayak in their peregrinations. In every locality where their name is found, there also we meet with their language, their religious and cosmogonic notions, their traditions, customs, architecture, and a host of other indications of their presence and permanency and of the influence they have exerted on the civilization of the aboriginal inhabitants. And they're talking about the whole world. My readers will judge for themselves of the correctness of this assertion. The reading of the Maya inscriptions and books, among other very interesting subjects, reveals the origin of many narratives that have come down to us as traditions in the sacred books of various nations and which are regarded by many as inexplicable myths. So they're talking about how it's basically the same stories of the gods, right? Same mythology, right? Reoccurring, duplicating all over the world, repeating, right? And you find it in these same Maya inscriptions, all these myths, all right? We're gonna show you this in future videos. Trust me, I'm gonna show you that you can find all mod all these, all mythology, Hindu, Egyptian, all that over here. The same gods, the same things they did, attributed with the same characters, everything. All right? For instance, we find in them the history of certain personages who, after their death, became the gods most universally revered by the Egyptians, Isis, and Osiris, who earthly history related by Wilkinson and other writers who regarded as a myth corresponds exactly to that of Queen Mu. Queen Mu is Isis, that's what he's telling you. Her brother, husband, Prince Cole, is Osiris, whose charred heart was found by me, preserved in a stone urn in his mausoleum at Chichen. He found us, Augustus. He did archaeological work and he found his statue, all right? Osiris, we are told, was killed by his brother through jealousy. And because his murderer wished to seize the reins of the government, he made war against the widow, his own sister whom he came to hate bitterly after having been madly in love with her. In these same books, we learn the true meaning of the tree of knowledge. In the middle of the garden of the temptation of the woman by the serpent offering her a fruit, this offering of a fruit as a declaration of love, which was a common occurrence in the everyday life of the Mayas, Egyptians, and Greeks, losses all loses all the semen incongruity it presents in the narrative of Genesis for lack of word of explanation. But this shows how very simple facts have been and still are made use of by crafty men, such as the high priest Hilkia, to devise religious speculations and impose on the good faith of ignorant, credulous, and superstitious masses. It is on this story of the courting of Queen Mu by Prince Ak, Ak, the murderer of her husband, purposely disfigured by the scheming Jewish priest Hilkia, hmm, who made the woman appear to have yielded to her tempster, perhaps out of his spite against the prophetess Hulda, she having refused to countenance his fraud and to become his accomplice in it, that rests the whole fabric of the Christian religion, which since the advent in the world has been the cause of so much bloodshed and so many atrocious crimes. In these Maya writings, we also meet with the solution of that much mooted question among modern scientists, the existence, destruction, and submergence of a large island in the Atlantic Ocean, as related by Plato and his Timaeus and Critias. In consequence of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions, of this dreadful cataclysm in which perished 64 million of human beings, four different authors have left descriptions in the Maya language. Two of these narratives are illustrated. They're contained in the Toronto manuscript, the other in the Codex Cortesianus. The third has been engraved on stone in relief and placed for safekeeping in a room in a building at Chichen where it exists today, sheltered from the action of the elements and preserved for the knowledge of coming generations. The fourth was written thousands of miles from Mayak in Athens, the brilliant Grecian capital in the form of an epic poem in the Maya language. Oof. Each line of said poem formed by a composed word is the name of one of the letters of the Greek alphabet, rearranged as we have it 
403 years before the Christian era under the archonship of Euclides. All right? And, you know, if you really look at ancient Greek and then you compare it with ancient Paleo-Hebrew, right? You're going to see a, a very similar similarity there. So they're saying that, look, look where the Greek language really came from, the Maya. So what did the Maya really speak? What is the real mother tongue, right? Ibariath. Ibariath. All right. Continuing the book, Queen Mu and the Egyptian Things by Augustus uh, Plongeon. It says here in the preface still we're at, fleeing from the wrath of her brother Ak, Queen Mu directed her course toward the rising sun in the hope of finding shelter in some of the remnants of the land of Mu, as the Azores, for instance. So remember, if you're in America and you're going towards the rising sun, that means you're going to the east, right? Where the sun rises, right? East, so you're going towards Africa, or like what they said here, the Azores, right? Canary Islands, Cape Verde, West Africa, right? Failing to fall with such place of refuge as she was seeking, she continued her journey eastward and at last reached the Maya colonies that for many years had been established on the banks of the Nile. These were Maya colonies, or as they have called them, Atlantis colonies. But Atlantis was here. It's all the same kingdom. All right. So remember, that she says that she reached the Maya colonies that were in the Nile. The settlers received her with open arms, called her the little sister, Ixing, or Ixing, Isis, Ixing, Isis, and proclaimed her their queen. Before leaving her mother country in the West, she had caused to be erected not only a memorial hall to the memory of her brother, husband, but also a superb mausoleum in which were placed his remains and his statue representing him. On the top of the monument was his totem, a dying leopard with a human head. So wait a minute, if we're talking about America, right? You saw my Black Panther video, right? We don't have leopards in America, we got jaguars. So it's not a dying leopard, it's a dying jaguar with a human head, jaguar warrior, right? A veritable finx. So that's what the finx was? You hear what they're telling you, right? Because we know the Fing's head is not the real one, the, the one we see today, right? So what really it was? She's saying it was a dying leopard, right? So what was outside that it had jaguar spots? We're talking about America, right? There's no leopards over there, it's jaguars, all right? So she says she made a mausoleum before she left in that country, in America. Now, once established in the land of her adoption, right? Did she order the erection of another of his totems, again, a leopard with a human head, to preserve the memory among her followers? We're talking about jaguar, no leopards. The name inscribed on the base of the Egyptian Sphinx seems to suggest this conjecture. All right, you hear that? Through the ages, this Egyptian Sphinx has been the enigma of history. Has its solution at last been given by the ancient Maya archives? He's telling you that this is the story he found in these archives, in these codices on the walls, that she fled to, towards that Nile, to the colony on the other side, towards the east, and that she built the Sphinx in commemorance to her brother, a jaguar warrior, or a leopard, a so-called leopard with a human head, a jaguar warrior. Has its solution of the Sphinx at last been given by the ancient Maya archives? All right, think about that. Are we going to reveal this? 